You're now tuning in to the Ambitious Views Podcast, where we share unique perspectives on storytelling within film and television from the past, present, and future. We're here for a good time, not a long time. So let's get to it. What's up, Ambitious Views fam? (laughs) Hope y'all are doing great. Hope y'all are having a great time. Uh, on this day or whenever you end up seeing it. I mean, listening to this, you may be listening to this at night before you go to bed, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, uh, welcome back to another episode of the Ambitious Views podcast. I am your host, as usual, Corrigan, and my great co-host. Blaze, what's up? Yeah. How you doing, Blaze? I am good. Good, good. Um, been doing the student orientation, so mm. they working me. But it's been great. It's been great. I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying that part of my job a whole okay. lot more than I thought I would. So that's dope. Yeah, I can see that because, like, um, I used to be an orientation. Did you used to be an orientation leader? No. Yeah, being an orientation leader and then definitely coming in and working with uh the director over uh the orientation program at the university uh coming in and doing the sessions that I do um it's very energetic um mm-hmm. and kind of inspiring like a good boost to the next year because you get to see fresh faces either they're yep. excited or you can tell they're a little nervous and mm-hmm. then when they start feel a little bit better and it just really feels good to be able to answer the questions and see that satisfaction on people's faces. So, yeah. And then all the stuff that like, you know, you and your coworkers be complaining that students don't know, you get to tell them that, you know, or at least you become like a point of contact for them. So when stuff come up and they don't know who to talk to, then you get to help them out. So it's like you, you help them build more informed students. And I like that part. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, today, Blaze, you know, as the old saying goes, we're here for a good time, not a long time. This episode is primarily going to be all about a full review of Queen Charlotte. So, so I can I can talk about everything I remember now. Everything that you remember, because for those of you who checked it out, the reason why Blaze started getting a little quiet, because <laughs> unfortunately, she could not find ways to interject without spoiling it, which I really do appreciate, which now that I watched it, I can definitely see why she's like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that's going to be the main thing of this episode. But as always, we like to pop it off with a good old this and that. And this is my wet. time to shine. My wet. time, not blaze. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> But are you ready? Because, you know, I stay ready. You tried to be ready last week, you know, just a little bit. Okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> um, I actually have a surprise. I actually have two this or that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's okay because, like I said, I stay ready. So mm-hmm. let's go. Say you had to go on a very unique adventure and you have <laughs> to pick between the two which one would you choose a jurassic park not world a jurassic park adventure or a national treasure adventure so basically the og like basically you'll be a part of the og series of jurassic park and then into um national treasure which you know is a disney content with uh disney film with nicholas cage which was actually a very uh a very fun film to watch so but if you had to pick which adventure to be a part of which one would you pick that's easy i hate animals the extra treasure i hate animals hate them but people gonna be shooting at you at national treasure let them shoot oh (laughs) <laughs> i'll be ducking and diving but yeah, i'll find like that treasure world. plus yeah. national treasure for me like that's more up my alley like the mystery aspect of it discovering and stuff that's mm-hmm. fun but jurassic park or jurassic world there's dinosaurs like i'm good <laughs> i am good i couldn't be the first cave woman because i would have died <laughs> i'm not dealing with that I feel like you'll survive. 
You think I would survive? Yeah. No. Oh, thank you. He's a... <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I thought I'd be the first person dead. Cause I if a if a if a dinosaur run up on me, I'm gonna be like, what's up, God? You know? Uh, like... <laughs> they dying to meet you. <laughs> And die, yeah. <laughs> wow. I not, what I look like fighting a dinosaur, like no. Nah. You're supposed to run and hide and feed them. I don't think I'll outrun a dinosaur and feed them. Yeah. Feed them myself. <laughs> oh, no, you feed them the trees and the omnivores who don't eat you. I'm good. National treasure me. You know, I get to find something. Um, discover something that nobody else knows about. Yeah, people gonna be shooting at me. It's like people shoot at you. People are a, a dinosaur's trying to bite you and eat you. Mm. I can I can probably I can you know duck and die from a bullet, but mm. I can't outrun a dinosaur. Okay, I ain't gonna lie. I probably do the same thing. See, thought you oh. had me. Well, I know I got you with this one. So. For those of you who don't know, Blaze calls herself um, a basketball fan, apparently, that I did not know about. <laughs> and apparently she was very excited about, uh-huh, yeah, I'm going there. Apparently she called herself being so excited about Miami Heat winning. Congrats to them. I know that's right. Let's go Heat. Let's go Heat. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. But anyway, Blaze... Which team would you choose? The championship winning team of the Boston Celtics with KG, Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, Rondo, or Wade, LeBron, and other honorable mentions of that Not team? Not you said other honorable mentions like Chris Bosh doesn't exist, like Mario Chambers did. Oh, okay. Anyway, Miami Heat. Miami Heat. All right, Blaze. So you know, it's been well, you really, started with it's been really fun. It's been really fun doing this with you, but I'm gonna just be real with you. Like, okay, yeah, we, we can't be friends same, if you a Boston fan. I thought we was on the same way. Not with that. No, no, honestly, no. It seems like you your head ain't screwed on straight. Now, don't get me wrong. Right. I I um, do like that Boston team. I was a um Rondo fan. I was a Ray mm -hmm. Allen fan. Mm -hmm. I even messed with Paul Pierce um for a bit, but mm -hmm. I ain't I'm I'm not choosing anybody over Miami Heat. It's very few people that I may choose over Miami Heat. It's the yeah. quiet, it's the quiet fans for me. Like it's the what like, fans for you? Ain't nobody when nobody even think about Miami Heat until Wayne and LeBron James came. That's a lie. What you mean? People have been rocking with Heat forever. I've been rocking with the Heat forever. And by the way, speaking of that, I got I was talking to my daddy the other day, and he was like, people still don't believe you're really a basketball fan. And I'm like, one thing about me, I don't just waste my money on anything. Do you know how many Miami Heat shirts I have? Like, I'm a fan. I watch the games. I follow them. It's so unfortunate that you spend your money on nonsense. It's so unfortunate that you even think about Boston Celtics. Oh, okay. All right. Moving Especially right after on. you watched Winning Time. <laughs> <laughs> Every time Miami Heat plays Boston Celtics, especially since um, Pat Riley was a part of the Lakers at that time, I always think Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say that I think that was one of my favorite arcs that I enjoyed outside of learning about learning more about magic and uh Dr. Bus is learning about Pat Riley because it it blew my mind at literally how he became who he is today. Same, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it was really cool. So but yeah, but anyway. Go Boston. So anyway, um let's go. He <clears throat> okay, it is hot outside. So anyway, um <laughs> what's on your watch list, Blaze, besides Miami? <laughs> All right. 
since we're talking about Miami, though, <clears throat> I was watching the finals or the, you know, the last of the Eastern Conference finals and the Heat did beat the Boston Celtics, you know, uh, just saying, even though people are like, oh, Jason Tatum was injured. If he wouldn't have got injured, they would have won. Maybe the whole Miami Heat team been injured for five years and we still winning games. So let's yeah. not. In mm-hmm. fact, last season, Miami Heat, all of their star players were out for a good significant amount. And they were the number one team in the conference. But that anyway, I'll keep going. You know, uh, I don't want to keep shaming Corrigan. <laughs> um, last night, I finished St. X, which I talked a little bit about on the previous episode. It's a new show on um, Hulu. Um, the conclusion of it was last night. Um, so you got to figure out what happened to Allison, what happened, you know, just in the past in general, and how, how, how basically that really like you see how everybody's life got messed up because of that situation, but the realization that everybody had that final episode of like, dang, I really let this ruin my life. Was yeah. was very very interesting, and then trying to heal from that, making steps to actually heal. Um, and this past weekend, I also watched the season finale of Blind Spotting, um, which had a wonderful. I think it was the season finale that had this scene because I watched the last two episodes at the same time. Mm. But it had this wonderful scene where it talked about um, incarceration and being. The transition out, like once you get out of jail, what it's like in in that person's mind, the mental thing that they're going through as they transition to life outside of being in jail. And man, that scene was so epic. Like like I said before, with blind spotting, they they like to incorporate a, a lot of other art, so poetry, dance, and they included like this rap to do it. And it was just, it was awesome. Like I, my eyes were glued to the screen. Um, mm-hmm. I even on our new Twitter page, which you guys should check out. <laughs> Famous bug or whatever. But I even tweeted about it on our new Twitter uh, page. And one of the creators and writers, he, he liked that tweet, but I was just showing that show some love because this second season, like the first season is good, but the second season, they really, really stepped it up. Every single episode was a banger. Um, mm-hmm. And then pretty soon, I'm going to start Run the World season two. Um, mm-hmm. That started last week. I started rewatching the first season after our conversation the last time about it. Mm-hmm. I will say what I said before, I, I still stand beside it. Um, it does have some of the same elements as Harlem, but where Harlem can get like a little um kind of over the top run yeah. the world isn't as over the top it's it's like you said more grounded okay. um and some of the characters aren't as similar as um we were we were talking about before it's a really good show outside of like harlem are insecure so okay. i definitely suggest you know checking it out i'm excited to start the second season i've heard i've, I've read a few comments about it and you know, I've heard that that first the first episode that was released last week was pretty good. That's dope. That's dope. So, um, what I was gonna say, oh, going back to what you mentioned about like coming out of jail, um, like that experience or whatever, that kind of reminded me of um how they followed the lives of the exonerated five, um, on um when they see us, especially mm-hmm. like seeing like how it affected Ray you know, going and trying to get back acclimated and everything like that to having a hard time trying to get a job and keeping a job and stuff to where basically you resolve back to what's easy um, and what can, what can, he can make work and stuff like that. So I do appreciate how, you know, different platforms like film, television, other things bring, you know, light to that because that just shows that, Hey, if you're going to accuse someone and the justice system is going to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Make sure it's as right as possible. And mm-hmm. also, this is that's a complete, that's a perfect reason why we need to make sure that people are guilty for what they do and not just be up and just be like holding them, you know, for forever and having them mm-hmm. go through 
records and all this stuff like that because, like, you know, records, that holds a lot, man. It keeps people mm -hmm. being able to be civil when you're claiming that it's supposed to help them become better civilized for the, the local community that they're in. So, mm -hmm. so that's really good. That's really good that that, that brought that up. So, um, what's on your so watch list? You said what? Oh, said, what's, on, what's mine? on your watch list? Yeah, so um, to be honest, uh, these past few days have been a little crazy. Uh, the only thing I've been able to really, really just lock onto and watch has been Queen Charlotte. I will say that's what's on my watch list um, to watch in the future is Unseen. Blaze, have you seen Unseen yet? Mm-mm. By the same company who did uh, Blood and Water. So maybe we should do that together. Blood. Yeah. <laughs> Blood and water. Yes. Is it a and movie or it's a no, series it's a documentary, right? It's a mini series. And the one who played Poo Lang's mom is the uh lead actor. Oh, okay. I see it now. Yeah, and so I just actually randomly watched it one day within a day, I think. If not a day, two days. It was a pretty quick watch, kind of like how blood and water can be and uh, she said it was really good so I definitely want to um, check that out so maybe that's another thing that we'll jump on as you know content is kind of slowing down jumping on some some uh, past content that we haven't seen but the same people who produced blood and water did unseen so hmm. oh yeah so but other than that I'm gonna just let y'all know I game a little bit not a lot but a little um, and so right now um, I'm on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I'm kind of doing a whole catch up. You know, I went from basically Xbox 360 to <laughs> jumping all the way to Xbox Series S. And so um, getting back into the whole gaming thing whenever I have a little time just to relax and chill and stuff. So, um, but yeah, but um, jumping on into the real take, uh, Blaze, did you have a chance to watch the I'm a Virgo trailer? I did. I've been seeing um, promo about that for the past few months, yes. but I didn't know really what, what it was about. about. You know, because I follow um, the guy that's in it that's from on my block, I think Brett Gray. And mm -hmm. so I see it all the time, but I'm, I, I didn't know what it was about. But I always had plans to check it out because I'm a fan of him. Um, he was great at on my block. But mm -hmm. seeing the trailer, I was like, what this is, is not what I what I thought it was about at all. I don't know what I thought it was before, but um, this is different, you know, which is fun. What I like, uh, what a lot of, um, I guess, production companies, writers and stuff are doing lately is they're experimenting and doing different stuff. That's that's fun because um, yeah. we need, you know, some original stuff. We don't always want to reboot or a remake or a sequel. So... I'm excited to see it, you know, a movie about a giant. A movie about a Virgo giant. A movie about a Virgo who is also a giant. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Boots Riley, uh, I think I may have mentioned this on a previous episode, but he had came to Northwest Arkansas. Oh, and so cool. I went to go um, see him speak at the library. They're doing, you know, a pretty cool series and uh, it was really dope, him kind of just sharing his his path and how he is today because he went from music and then into filmmaking. So this is actually his second big project. Um, his first one, if you don't know who this is, uh, his first big project that got a lot of buzz was Sorry to Bother You with Lakeith as the lead. Um, and so this is his next big project. Um, and it looks really good. And, and kind of going back to what you said, Blaze, it's very inspiring as a creative to really make sure I'm challenging myself to be as creative as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just love the fact that we're seeing Black people and just people of color in general in more unique stories than we yes. understand, especially yes. when it comes to fantasy or just what in the world is going on, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it being okay and not be like, you know, why are you in this space of this creative mm -hmm. thing? So or I'm them basing it so much on their blackness, you know, like it's really just about the character and, you know, the situation that's around that character. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, um, Boots Riley is big on, on being an activist. So I'm very interested to see 
what's going to be the underlining message with this, especially it being a series. And then um, I think his name uh, is Jarrell, I believe, who plays um, the lead uh, actor. Correct me if I'm wrong. Plays is it Jarrell? I think it's Jarrell. Um, and um, he he was pretty much the standout actor in the When When They See Us series. Um, and so uh, he did an awesome job, and he won a few awards, including the Screen Actors Guild Award. Um, but he's a, he's a very powerful actor. He's on the younger side as well. Um, and so I, I feel like it was really dope for him to go from what he, he did and when they see us. Uh, he's all, He was also in... Uh, uh, in Creek it? Cowboy, Moonlight. Moonlight. He was in Moonlight as well. Uh, and so for him to go from those two things to this, I think it's really dope and it's showing his range. Um, and so I'm really interested to see what, you know, will definitely be next uh, with his character, you know. So, uh, but also, um, um, it comes out on our anniversary, wedding anniversary. So uh, we may actually be able to binge a little bit of that, depending on what our extra plans will be for that weekend and stuff like that. So um, I'm looking forward to really uh, checking that out. I look like it'll be fun. So yeah. um, moving on to the... Uh, current strike that is going on um not that unintentionally i've been doing updates on this and i don't know if i said this last week but um i think the screen actors guild um association pretty much is an organization um is pretty close to possibly voting to support and stand along with the strike of wga um so again i'm interested to see how that's going to go i know i passively came across a tiktok where someone was saying i think it was um straw hat goofy i think he mentioned how they just started filming um deadpool 3 and how pretty much since ryan reynolds is not only just the actor but he's a writer on deadpool 3 that he can't add in any um ad libs or anything like that like he can't mm -hmm and do uh, any of that so not ad libs what i want to say he can't add in any um script changes improv, and stuff like that can't improv anything um in this project so um so yeah so it's very interesting how things are turning out but you know ultimately i do feel like things will work out sooner or later um it may not be in the best interest as like the powers that be but hey you got to do what you got to do mm -hmm. so um but um, Vanity Fair, I saw that they, um, posted this, I think I saw this earlier today or yesterday, um, but a very unique, uh, headline where it said that the untold story of lost poisonous culture. Have you ever seen Lost Blaze? I've never watched Lost before. I always thought about watching it. Yeah. Same but here. Yeah, same here, same here. So apparently, I guess, you know, truth is coming about coming out about how the culture and the the atmosphere was, you know, on the production side of things. And one of the quotes that I read from the post was somebody said, I can only describe it as hazing one ex lost mm. writer says. Mm. It was very much middle school and relentless cruel. And I've never heard that much racist commentary in one room in my career. Um, oh, right. So, which I'm not surprised because honestly, this like loss was going on when I was very young. I'm pretty sure I was in middle school, elementary by that time. So, mm -hmm. um, not not quite surprised because everybody didn't have like DEI training and training, and sometimes people just out here hustling doesn't excuse people for for their action. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, like I, I'm very interested to see if this is going to end up leading to a documentary. Of course. Um, and um, I'm definitely going to probably be tuning in. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy that you, you know, you got that on our list to talk about because I saw a tweet earlier. Um, I don't remember what the actor's name is, but he said that um, he brought up like the racism and stuff and once on set. And that's actually how he ended up getting off the show because he tried to point out, you know, some of the bad stuff that was happening with race and they fired him. Wow. And that probably would have been easily maybe a lawsuit depending mm -hmm. on 
depending on the evidence and all this stuff like that or whatever. That's that's so sad. And that's one thing I will say, Blaze, like, you know, depending on what, what my life has for me in the future or whatever as a filmmaker, but, you know, I will say that all that I've learned on the professional side of working in higher ed and just in other areas of training and stuff like that, like, my sets will be as professional as possible. We're yeah. not going to be coming in there acting and doing any type of thing. We're going to act civilized. We're going to treat each other with respect. Um, from Have from a good HR department. Yeah, like from the top to the bottom and, and in reverse and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I really don't like it's It's very sad to hear about when it comes to like the production side of things to like actors being rude um, to the crew, you know, being um just pretty much just very dismissive of things and all this stuff like that. I just feel like that is very sad. And I feel like Hollywood overall is too old to not be correcting that. But I think that also shows that when you have the power of money and people give you the power of your voice um, instead of people acting as the power, because the power is in the people that, you know, these things just keep happening. You know, but I do feel like things are getting better. I know Michael B. Jordan and others, you know, utilize this writer to where there are certain things that have to be set in place, even when it comes to representation in front of and behind the camera and stuff like that. So I feel like when more like A-listers and, and other filmmakers start pushing these type of things, I feel like hopefully the culture and the atmosphere are different sets, especially if it's on a bigger scale, uh, will become more healthier. Um and stuff like that. So, but um, but yeah, that's something. Um, Blaze, have you been able to check out the Little Mermaid yet? No, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard very good reviews about it, so I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, same here, same here. I saw that they um on Deadline, Deadline had released that Little Mermaid had made up to around between three hundred to three hundred fifty million domestically. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, I'm hoping, you know, things really turn out or whatever. I saw this post, it may have been on TikTok or something where they were showing pretty much the evolution of Haley's, uh, uh Haley's, um, uh, acting career, you know, as far as how young she started similar to Chloe and stuff like that. So I'm really happy for, her. I hope that, um, this could lead to some more things. It seems like, you know, she's really blossoming into a very, solid career path and I'm interested to see what else she has outside of color purple because that's a totally different role uh from that and so I feel like that's ultimately um showing her range and so I'm really really hoping that things you know you know turn out for turn out for the best and um I'm wondering I guess if we're gonna end up seeing Lilo and Stitch as the next live action film before anything but it's very interesting that we haven't heard anything else lately about uh, the lot the Lion King 2 live action that's supposed to be coming out. Did you hear about that a while back? I have not. Yeah, I think so you mentioned it before, and I was like, oh. Yeah, I think it was Barry Jink. I think it's Barry Jenkins who's the director. He was the writer and director of Moonlight. And um mm. this Lion King live action is supposed to be based on Mufasa's uh coming of coming of age story to becoming king. Mm. That sounds so, interesting. So, yeah, so it'll be a fresh story and stuff like that. I guess, as always, I'm very interested to see how they're going to tell it. Um, are they going to keep the same approach as the first one? Um, how it's like, yeah, we get live action. Yeah, the, the animals look extremely uh, real. Um, but when it comes to showing the emotion, it was kind of lackluster in those It things. was. It was so awkward. I was like, yeah. so, they, so they face is just not going to move reflect how they feel like, you know is... yeah so you know are we going to get that or are we going to get something similar to like a balance between i i think jungle book did it but i know definitely uh especially with the beast uh we got it with uh beauty and the beast mm -hmm. stuff like that so i'm interested to see the the way that barry jenkins will be, barry jenkins will be approaching this and this itself is showing a pretty great range when it comes to just being a filmmaker, you know, for if, if Bill Street could talk to Moon, well, Moonlight to Bill Street could talk and then this film. So, but, but other than that, Go Little Mermaid 
Um, I didn't get to look up uh, how the uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse um, is going, but I didn't realize both of them were dropping on the same weekend. So, and I've been hearing really great reviews about that as well. Straw Hat. Um, Goofy actually mentioned on TikTok that he felt that this Spider-Man is the best of all Spider-Man movies. I've heard that, like... And you know, like Spider Man is that's my probably my favorite si superhero. So I'm always interested in Spider Man movies. So I can't wait to see that. Yeah, I'm very interested to see like what's the take on that. Like it was really good. The story was great. I think the only thing that was hard for me with my eyes adjusting to almost kind of the tad approach, the tad big approach to the comic book feel. Mm -hmm. or the um, it's almost kind of like. I wouldn't say stop motion, but it was kind of like that. So at times my eyes had to adjust, especially for a long period of time looking at it. But it definitely was a really good story, the last film. But it's been so long for me. And then I haven't been, I've been trying my, my best not to overwhelm myself with trying to have a pre-thought of what it really is about. Because I do feel like it's a lot in it that's not being shown. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see. So very, uh, very rare to see it. So, um, but it's about that time for us to jump on into Queen Charlotte. Um, so for the viewers, if you haven't seen it yet, if you take your time, if you only watch two episodes like we did, like I had last time we watched, definitely go ahead and jump off because we are going all in on talking about our thoughts on Queen Charlotte, uh, which it was a very, very great story. Um, and I first, I first want to say, Blaze, that now finishing it, out of all three, um, I guess series in a sense, I guess you can say, because I feel like the first two is kind of more connected, and this one is kind of almost a standalone to a certain degree. This is my favorite out of yeah. all. Yeah, agree. How did you? Um, what was just some of the themes and stuff like that? Did you feel like? really resonated with you and just on the storytelling aspect with this this series on the storytelling aspect i i always like you know when people go back and forth between times but the story that they are telling in in i guess real time um with her with charlotte and her children was was really interesting and beautiful like and towards the end when her daughter was like I couldn't I couldn't leave you and even uh what's his name Ben Bimsley when he says to her you know you are you are still the queen or you're you're still the queen you never really got a chance you're stuck in um you're frozen in time that's what he said you're frozen in time and I think that was a great way to sum up what they're trying to get across um in the in in the series was that she fell in love with somebody who really needed her support mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she has had to support him as well as be a queen and because of that she hasn't really had the time to um probably invest in her children as much as she wanted to not to say she was like a bad mom or anything but her kids probably saw in her nobody's taking care of you mom so I gotta stay and I gotta take care of you right. um and it was a very interesting and different story about a royal family because usually it's always like it is just about them getting married and them preser preserving the line and so mm -hmm. it was it was very refreshing to see a storyline where these kids they weren't rebelling because they didn't want to get married or because they didn't want to fulfill the family legacy. They they weren't getting married because they cared about their parents and they wanted to be there for their mom. Um, so I really liked that element. And then I also liked the element of, um, what's her name, Violet and Lady Dandry and their conversations and their whole storyline with each other, especially when Violet had that realization like <laughs> you was with my daddy but they didn't talk about problem. it it was just <laughs> it was just like what's like why why even be mad about it you know like they just kind of yeah. went on about their business and kind of gave each other that look like 
I know you know, and you know I know, but you know it's it's whatever. Yeah. But I I enjoyed that story as well because Charlotte got married obviously out of service, but she had the opportunity to fall in love, and yeah. Violet had the opportunity to fall in love. But Lady Dandry, she didn't have that opportunity. Um, you know, she has that scene where since she, I think she said since she was three years old, she was raised to be his wife. Yeah. And so she just did her duties. And mm -hmm. the time that she did find love, it unfortunately was with somebody who was already in a relationship. But mm -hmm. also, if you add on to the element of her even getting remarried to anyone would mean falling back into the same thing yeah. with her yeah. previous husband. And so to have that freedom and still be able to be a part of the conversation or be important, um, what she had to do at a young age, number one, and then with the whole experiment and stuff that could have failed at any time, like mm -hmm. that storyline and that element, like I would like to see a season about her continued growth to how she, en she still ended up getting to where she is because you know, they talk about how the experiment could have failed at any time. And so it's like, how did this woman stay single for so long and stay um, important and relevant, rich, all of this without being married? Yeah, I feel like that um, that perspective was very unique. And I was really wondering how things were going to go and if it would have moved forward with uh, Queen Charlotte's brother. Uh, with Lady Danbury, you know, at first I was like, wow, like, okay, I didn't know nothing about this. And like, maybe this is what they were talking about, even though they were already hinting at the fact that, you know, she had a thing for Violet's um, father, which for those of you who are kind of trying to figure out who we're talking about, because I know like sometimes I get kind of lost with the names. Violet is the mother of the, the main family of Bridgerton. And so, you know, of course, at this moment, going back and forth, like current in current time, she's a widow and stuff like that or whatever. And um, it's just a very unique story um, of her kind of refining, you know, kind of, you know, finding herself again, you know, being, you know, a single mother and also being a widow and uh, just kind of finding her life again and finding out, you know, what works for her and, and just learning more about herself. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I feel like there was a very unique thing, how they led to with Lady Danbury's, uh, life, you know, when it comes to her choosing, you know, I think it's just kind of, it's like on one point you're happy that she didn't allow herself to be kind of trapped in the same, in a loveless relationship, basically aware of like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you're happy on one end, but then at the other time it's just like, dang, but as you can see between Queen Charlotte that we really didn't realize how much of love was truly there until mm -hmm. the end, which is like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, but you know, um, it is what it is and stuff like that. And so, yeah, like I, I really enjoyed how they told this story. Um, like you mentioned in last week's episode, to, like how compatible the two actors were who mm -hmm. played, um, the the royals you know in a sense of where like that was just so great so great and um yeah you know, you know i just um I, I think the main thing that I, when i kept on watching i was like where is this gonna lead to like is she gonna leave like well, well not is she gonna leave it's just like okay they the babies came from somewhere do you have babies <laughs> with somebody else you know what i'm saying because it's just like it's oh. not compatible because early on i really thought what ended up happening she stayed in her house, he stayed in his, and he basically had children by somebody else because he didn't want to have it with her. He was just fulfilling the obligation um, and stuff like that. That's what I originally thought. Because I ain't gonna lie, my main thought was like, how did them two get together and, and their kids look like this? Right. <laughs> I'm like, they definitely, they definitely could have been a little bit more consistent with um, the kids. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely put me in the mindset of uh, the Cinderella story with Brandy and uh, Whitney Houston. <laughs> yeah. It's like, who who are these kids' parents? Because, no, ain't no way. 
Yeah, so that that was passively comical, which I know they they knew that wasn't you know whatever, but it didn't take away from the story. But it was it was really good, man. And I just um, things that I just like I said again, the reason why I liked this so much because it was just so much easier for me to keep up with the characters that were presented, um, yeah. even to you know King James's. Um, mother it was easy to follow her it was easy to understand her basically she was just a loving mother at the end of the day that was overprotective of her son mm -hmm. and and it was just a beautiful thing for her to finally see that like on one end you know the battle with you know queen charlotte like oh, okay she got him i can back off now i know that he's going to be in good hands and then on the flip side it's just like also with lady danbury she's like hey you almost kind of like me. And I still I'm like my husband is gone and I'm not the queen anymore. I'm just, you know, princess that's trying to keep things in line. And I need you to be my basically my homegirl, my eyes and ears, and keep me up with what's going on or whatever. And so that, that oh, moment, speaking of that, one yeah. of my favorite scenes was when um the king's mom and Lady Dandry were talking and Lady Danji started crying and she was like, yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. Wait a yes. minute. She's like, nah, we supposed to be like rivals, honey. I I don't want to see you in this way. I need you to yep. wipe them tears and Come press on. through. Like, yeah. I, that was a really good moment. Mm -hmm. Very good moment. It's almost kind of one of those things like, no, nah, like you're you going to be strong with me. Like we're going we gonna to hustle through this or whatever like that. And mm -hmm. I also feel like that kind of gave Lady Danbury the uh strength to really push forward or whatever when it came to just being who she is later on in the series which is what we got starting off you know so yeah. Yeah. Um, and it yeah, also like, gave the um king's mom like a different layer like mm. it, it showed that she it's like she, it was like her acknowledging um the struggles that people like lady dandry have to go through and she was putting like the race aside and just saying like, you know, like as women, we got to we got to stand strong. And if you want something, you got to fight for it, you know? Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. And I'm glad that like even if it was unintentional, I'm glad it played out that way, because I do feel like this whole thing of just, you know. You know, all women are the same, just pushing through and stuff like that. And that's not the case. Like, yeah women in general yes you have your struggles things you have to overcome but when it comes to women of color it's a yep. double thing yep. double triple thing that mm -hmm. you have to go through or whatever so i appreciate that just sit down that that creating that space and and having dialogue and and giving that grace or whatever uh came into play so yeah i definitely do agree with that it was so many themes in this and like i said i do feel like Another reason why I feel like you and I liked it so much because we talked about with the past Bridgertons is that, you know, where does race play out in this space, especially at that that time period, you know what I'm saying? And and so like just being able to do that, um ain't there like seamlessly and just it made sense and it wasn't forced. Um I really Yes, it wasn't forced. Yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't like a woe woe is me. It's like no, like this is how I should be. I expected them to say things like this, like this makes mm -hmm. sense, you know? And, um, and I will say going back, I think last week I was saying something about the King having Alzheimer's, but you know, Audra kind of like, not kind of, she brought a great point to where his mannerisms and how things going, that is show more signs of schizophrenia more than anything mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so I feel like even when it comes to mental health, I do appreciate them trying their best to bring that to light as well and just showing that there is like whatever mental health whatever mental things that you're going through as a person like you're still a person and it takes mm -hmm. it takes love and it takes patience to really work with anybody with mental disabilities or abilities yeah um, and stuff like that and those who are dealing with things like it just takes patience and love and I think that's what made the ending so freaking good so good mm -hmm. um, like was you expecting that at the end did you expect no. that no 
Oh my gosh, man. The coming in. The, I've been saying James George. Sorry. <laughs> it's King George, right? It's King George. Yeah. Mad King George. Yeah. And like, you know, I said James earlier, but George, you know, it's just like, you know, her coming in and being excited about the child and uh, them finally being able to have a, a grandchild out of, you know, marriage. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, her having a hard time and still being patient with him after all these years, which I felt that's why I was kind of confused that like, you know, was she just being patient with him at that one scene or whatever that he finally came out or what? But her getting under the bed uh, like they used to do and just talking. I'm like, oh, my gosh, mm-hmm. man, this is just that, another that- thing, too, is and I don't I think we talked about this after we recorded last week, mm-hmm. but, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize that this King George is the King George that was going on a ma- around the American Revolution. And that's why I say Mad King George, because that's what they called them. Mm-hmm. But it makes you think, like, how insensitive that was. And, I mean, granted, they didn't know what was going on with him, you know. They thought that he, you know, was just a tyrant or whatever, but like to see it from his perspective and see like he actually had a lot of stuff going on in his life is in trying to get his mental health and prove that he still is capable of being king and mm. and still being so young and all of that, you know, it makes you think now it would have been so it, it would have been better if they could have had a better conversation. Not that the American Revolution didn't need to happen. <laughs> it needed to happen. But, you know, just better communication about what was going on. And I get it. They, could, they couldn't reveal things like that because um, he probably would have been taken off the throne or, you know, probably would have been more work. It would have been um, worse for them mm-hmm. um, in that situation and war and all of that. But the things that we say about people when we don't know what's going on with them, like you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and so I, I, I like that aspect that we learn from this show because these, some of these people are real people. It's mm-hmm. just a fictional tale about them. Mm-hmm. And so seeing something that took place during the American revolution from the English perspective um for me was really, really interesting. Things like that um, interest me a lot. I'm a huge Hamilton fan and stuff, so. Yeah, that's really dope. That's really dope. So um, as we kind of easing on now, Blaze, like what, like, what do you feel like, do you feel like there was more behind Queen Charlotte being just happy about a grandchild? Do you feel like that represented something else? I'm sure it probably represented something else. Yeah, I kind of wonder, was it one of those things of like, does she feel like she can finally find a way to step away kind of mm-hmm. thing? Um, and finally see her own her own fate as it keep on going. And and I also wonder how will this play out into the future of Bridgerton um series as it keeps on um, unfolding because I assume it'll be probably ended maybe in the next two or three seasons maybe. No, um, they got like 15 kids. It's it's a season per kids. Oh no. Really? Um, it's a yeah. Season per kid? Yeah. Really? Per, per Bridgerton kid. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. The book series follows is a, is a is about one of the kids each book. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned the good point too of like um if she was happy about something else. Um what I did because like when I watch historical um dramas, I'm I'm a huge period piece person. I like the Tudors, Rain, um the white the white queen, the white princess, Spanish princess, like I like stuff like that. Um, And so I always do my research because they're usually about real people. And um, Queen Charlotte actually died before King George. And so I wonder if if that excitement, too, of of that grand of hearing about that grandchild was also like her. I wonder if she was maybe getting sick or something and her hearing about a grandchild also gave her peace because she knew that she was like 
it was an extra step of her fulfilling her duties as queen and yeah. as like a, a mom or something. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, that's interesting to know. And just kind of going back on Queen Charlotte, man, the young, like, again, please, I, I really do feel like um, the woman who played the younger Queen Charlotte needs a freaking Screen Actors Guild nomination. Like, oh, sure. Yes, definitely. Ain't there maybe even Emmy nomination, like, but like even like, regards, press. <laughs> and like, just being able to just say, you know, that piece and just seems so much like the older one. Like, it was just mm -hmm. really great to see. It reminded me a lot of, did you watch um, Little Fires Everywhere? Oh, yeah. You remember that episode where it goes into Carrie Washington's character when she was younger and the girl that they got to play younger Carrie Washington? Oh, yeah. That girl was phenomenal. Like, oh, yeah. she had Kerry Washington's mannerisms down to a T. <laughs> you watched anything of, of Kerry Washington, you know, she when she cries, she cries a certain way. Like, that girl was amazing. But the, the young lady that played Queen Charlotte um, when she was younger, her performance was on that level as well. Yeah, yeah. I will say one of the things that because she did do a really great job. I think the only thing which is kind of hard not to is just like she did a in Little Fires Everywhere. She did a great job of acting as Carrie Washington as the character, as opposed I feel like this um, this experience was almost more like I'm embodying the character that has been developed as the older Queen Charlotte as the younger Queen Charlotte. And it's just, and I feel and, like that's, go yeah, ahead, go ahead. that's actually a great point to make because when character or when actors are in that situation, they do have to remember that they're playing that character, a younger version and not just to look at the other mm -hmm. actor that's playing the acting version. And I agree, she did do a good job of just being that character and it mm -hmm. made it easier for us to see that development. Oh, really easy. It's just, it literally felt like this is definitely older, even physically, like the casting was really great as well. Like it's overall is great. And I highly recommend if you haven't seen it, you didn't care for spoilers and you watching it now, like, I mean, or you listening to us now, definitely make sure that you check out uh, this series. I do feel like this is one of the best um, pieces of content that Netflix has put out as far as when it comes to the series and everything. And so definitely make sure you check it out. And I'm, and I will say I'm honest to, to know, like, what are you all's uh, favorite when it comes to the three series so far that we have of uh, the Bridgerton, you know, overall Bridgerton story on uh, Netflix. Like I said, I think Blaze and I both agree. We really enjoy Queen Charlotte just because of like the approach, it was easy to follow, even though they introduced different characters. Um, their layers were just really great, and uh, it was just overall an enjoyable uh, time to be watching this. So, um, but overall, Blaze, uh, do you have anything else when it comes to talking about Queen Charlotte? Um, no, nothing else when it comes to talking about Queen Charlotte. But I agree, I would love to hear um, how everybody else feels about it, and you know, which season was their favorite. Dope, dope, definitely, definitely. Well. As I always say, y'all, you know, we're here for a good time, not a long time, and we're getting ready to head on out. Um, but I just want to thank you all again for all the love on social media. We're we're mm -hmm. boosting it up. Like like Blaze said, we on Twitter, we on TikTok now. Uh, I still need to get things updated on YouTube, but it's pretty much what you're able to hear on all the other platforms as well. Just add a little visual. Um, and then hopefully maybe soon, if y'all just keep on listening in, we'll probably y'all be able to finally see our faces for those of you who do, don't know who we are, you know. So um, but we're going to keep on pushing this out to you all. We've really been enjoying this. Uh, as you know, we really enjoy talking about stories um, and just how they relate to life and everything like that. And, and just the beauty of art, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your time uh, whenever yeah. you're watching this. And other than that, peace. Peace.